I guess it's my job to introduce this person. This is John Grisham, everybody who, who does not need an introduction. That's the difference. That's the difference right there. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, speaking with John. And um, I'd like to start, obviously, with very simple questions. Is the origin of this particular project? Um, because you mentioned it in the acknowledgments, but it's a it's 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 an amazing starting point. Can you can you share that with yeah, the group? Yeah. F first of all, thank you. Uh, delighted to be here. My, uh, my first trip to the to the vineyard. Uh, I'm here with my wife, uh, Amor. Was practically raised here. Uh, parents, grandparents, and uh, spends a lot of time here. It's Amor down south. It's a more in like France, right? Or that's right. That's right. That's the way. Yeah. How, how do right. you say it? A more, you A got more. it. Okay, you got down it. south. Yeah. You're so southern. Uh, <laughs> but I love both of your books, and it's an honor to be here. We got together uh, about two years ago. I was touring, a small tour. And uh, what I'm doing nowadays when I publish, I go to six or eight or ten towns. And for the first time in a long time, I'm actually on the road. I love to go to bookstores. And so what I'm trying to do is go to great independent bookstores across the country, uh, to see the stores, to meet the fans, and have a good time. And wherever I go, I invite um, a local writer to come to the store, and we record it, and we do a podcast, and we talk for an hour, just like today. And so I invited uh, Amor to, 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 in his hometown, uh, uh, New York, Brooklyn, a couple years ago, and yep. we had a wonderful time um, uh, spending an hour together talking about books and writing. And it's fascinating for me because I've got in the past two years I've got to meet people like. A more. Uh, we did John Irving in uh, Toronto a few months back. Ian McEwen a couple months ago in New York. Uh, two years ago, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Sue Grafton right before she died. She was she was very ill. Never met her before. And uh, I have a list of writers I'm going to try to stalk and uh, <laughs> and do this very thing right here. We always record it and always have a a lot of fun. So uh, the fun part is uh, talking to writers and talking about writing and reading and and publishing and whatever you want to talk about. Uh, the fun part is is uh, taking questions from you folks, and we'll have some time at the end uh, to do that. As for this book, The Reckoning, um, it was published last October, and it's the first book I've uh, written uh, out of way too many books um, that took place takes place before I was actually born. The setting is 1940s to World War II, and uh, that presented some problems. Uh, the story, though, I think is based on something that's true. I don't know. It was told to me as a true story. When I was in the state legislature uh, many years ago in Mississippi, uh, I got elected when I was 28 years old, which should be against the law in every state, uh, <laughs> to elect people that young to go make important decisions about uh, the health and welfare of other people. It's, uh, it's not smart. Um, but I would go to the state capitol in Jackson, Mississippi, as a rookie uh, Democratic uh, state legislator. And as a rookie, we had nothing to do uh, because it, the committees were run by the old guys, and it was a very frustrating uh, time to be there. And, in fact, I wrote half of um, – I wrote about a third of a time to kill at the state capitol in Jackson, Mississippi <laughs> – I'm not kidding. I'd sneak off to committee rooms for hours and just sit there and, you know, work. I wrote probably a third of the firm at the state capitol in Jackson because I had nothing else to do. And, uh, but we, we, would gather, um, we, we would gather at coffee areas around the, ca the cap beautiful capitol and, and as we killed time and waited on committees or whatever. And we had my colleagues were these veteran politicians from all over rural Mississippi, and most of them were fantastic storytellers. And we would just sit and listen to these guys spin yarns. As a rookie, I was not allowed to speak. Uh, we had a pecking order. And one, one day a guy told a story that obviously stuck with me. It happened back in the 1930s in Mississippi in a small town. One day a prominent farmer drove to town, went to the hardware store, walked in. He knew the hardware store. He knew everybody. And he said, hello, Fred, whatever. Pulled out a gun and shot him three times in the head. And he drove back home sat on the front porch and waited for the sheriff. He knew the sheriff, he knew everybody. And so the sheriff finally drives up in the big squad car and said, get in the car. And he took him to jail. And as they were driving in, the sheriff said, um, okay, Pete, uh, why'd you do it? He said, I have nothing to say. So he took him to the jail, his lawyer showed up immediately and the lawyer said, what, what you killed a man, why'd you shoot him? He said, I have nothing to say. He went to trial and sat in the courtroom 
and would not take his defense, would not say a word. He said, I have nothing to say. So they found him guilty, and back then the appeals took only months, and, you know, the execution date was set. And back then um, they had the uh, – it was public hanging, and they would hang you – it's the 1930s – they would hang you on the lawn of the courthouse where you, where you were convicted. So they built the gallows, and they, it was a big deal. They were going to hang this guy, and a prominent man. And the day before uh, the execution, the governor – he knew the governor pretty well <laughs> – the governor took the train to the small town – went to the jail, and the governor said, uh, look, I don't want you to be executed, okay? Uh, hanging is for somebody else. You know, not you. You're, you're special. Um, if you'll tell me why you did it, if you'll tell us why you did it, I will commute your death sentence. You'll have life in prison, but you won't be killed tomorrow. He looked him in the face, and he said, I have nothing to say. And so the governor, who had never witnessed an execution, stayed in town that night, and watched it the next day on the front row. And he hung him. They hung him. And that's the story. I don't know if it's true, but it's a damn good story. And um, yeah, it, is. <laughs> it was told to me as a true story. I remember it as a true, 30 years ago. So in the acknowledgments, John has this great thing where she says, because I, 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 what, what was left unsaid here is the book is a retelling in a way of, of many of those events through John's imagination. With, uh, the, the, the man that is killed is, is not a hardware store owner. He's the preacher. And that's a different kind of question for you later, but, but uh, why you would be want to kill the preacher. But, 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 the, uh, but, it is, but in the acknowledgments, you say, uh, if anybody out there has heard this story before and, and recognized it, could you please come and tell me? Has anybody stood up yet and let you know that they've heard that story before? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, I cannot even remember which of my colleagues in the State House told the story. There were so many great storytellers. So if, if I could pin that down... I've asked some friends of mine who were older, who served in the state legislature and from, were from rural Mississippi, if they had ever heard the story before. Uh, about twice a year, uh, I get these huge boxes of letters that people send to me through Doubleday in New York. And there are a lot of them. And we go through all of them. And I have an assistant. We, we open them up and we read them. I try to respond to all of them. Most of them are people wanting money. Um, <laughs> Many of, them, many of them are named Grisham, and they're, they're going to get a lot of requests for money, a lot of requests for, uh, uh, you know, speaking engagements and, and things like travel, books. Yeah, a lot of nice folks. Uh, but a, a lot of them are true fan letters. And so we go through those, and I try to respond to all of those. And I'm hoping – I've got two big boxes in the office now I haven't even opened yet. Right. It takes a while to go through – and this the book is published in October. So I'm hoping that somewhere in those two big boxes we'll find a letter from somebody in – Podunk, Mississippi, who remembers the story from the 1930s. So I'm, I'm hoping it's there. I'm hoping it's a true story. So th th this opens up a, a whole series of questions. But the one I'd like to start with is that um, w w what the, the main events here, the murder, the, occurs page one. So there's no spoiler involved in, in sharing that with you. <laughs> I, I don't do mysteries very well. Yeah, okay. well, that's what, you know, what's interesting is, is yeah, <laughs> right. So we know, we, know, we know who killed the person, who gets killed, how he gets killed, he gets him arrested, he goes to, you know, it's all happening in rapid speed, and in fact, the trial is over at basically the 33% mark in the book. You're a third of the book and the trial is over. And I thought, one of the things that's interesting to me about it is that it's kind of a subversion of the genre that has made, you know, that made you famous as a, as a younger author, that, you know, as someone who is really the master of a suspense that is moving towards a courtroom. Sometimes the denouement is in the courtroom. Um, so, so what was it like to kind of flip this on the head where suddenly the trial was not at you know, the conclusion of the events, uh, where, where we see in advance who did it and, 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 and how they did it? Well, the, the, but the one big mystery, uh, I, was, I, was try, I tried my best to take the reader to the very last page before you know why. You know all the other questions have been answered, okay? But why did he do it? Why did he do it? And, that's, and I, I was able to pull that off. But to do that, you've got to be able to do what you are spectacular at. That's organizing the structure of the book and planning and plotting. And, and it's take, it, as you know, it, you spend more time outlining than you do writing. Uh, I spend a lot of time outlining, uh, not as much as you, but it's most writers say, well, I don't, I don't believe in outlining. I just create my characters and, and I follow them wherever they're going. That's a bunch of BS. Okay, you can't, you can't write, 
They all say that, though. Every other writer is going to say, oh, I, I, inspiration takes over and creativity takes over, and I just go off with my characters. BS. It's not true. You've got you to organize these things. When I, when I talked to John Irving in um, Toronto, I said, okay, first question, you, you reportedly have said that not only do you know the last scene before you write the first scene, but you write the last sentence before you write the first sentence. I'm not that smart, uh, but, <laughs> I, I, but I do know the last scene. I know, I know the final scene before I write. And he said, yes. He said, I try to make myself write the last sentence. Because when you write um, uh, suspense, mystery, thrillers, convoluted plots, uh, you better know where you're going when you start or you're going to get lost. How many authors do you, do you know who have a great idea, just a fantastic idea for a novel? Wicked plot, great characters, and they jump into it with tons of enthusiasm and write like crazy for about a year. And they realize they can't get out of it. What's the ending? Where, where are they going? And they just kind of run out of steam, run out of gas, and the books don't get finished, and you, you've wasted a year. And I'm just too lazy to waste a whole year like that. I'm not going <laughs> to... I like to plot and scheme. and So that was my goal, was to make you keep the big mystery to the very last page, and it worked. But where it's a mystery of motive, yeah. which is that. And I love that twist, too, that, that it's a mystery where that's the, the question. Not who did it, not how it was done, not how the, co not how the cops figured out, right. but the why. Right. Um, so th you mentioned that uh, this is the first book where you've gone back before your life, really, in, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way, to investigate the past. So that must have been, uh, what were the implications for you in terms of your process? Maybe this is part of that, but how did your process change to suddenly be writing a book yeah. that was set farther in the past uh, for you? Well, most of my books take place in, you know, contemporary America, and, and the settings, the legal setting is trials, courtrooms, lawyers, law firms, litigation, the stuff I know, the stuff I enjoy reading about, the stuff I enjoy writing about, and that's kind of, because I'm a lawyer, it's just sort of second nature. You know, I just, I don't have to do a lot of research when it comes to uh, legal things, and, and, and I, I love contemporary settings because there's so many issues I like to explore through the fiction, whether it's, you know, capital punishment or wrongful convictions or mass incarcerations or the death penalty, those are, those are raging current issues, and so it's easy to, to, to write those because I'm, I'm kind of living through that. With The Reckoning, though, the, the story takes place in the 1940s. I was born in 1955, and, and when I wrote, uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Painted House, which is a childhood memoir, uh, and it's about me as a little boy growing up in Arkansas on a cotton farm, but I had my parents to, as resources, and I asked my parents all the time, you know, what was life like in rural Arkansas, the rural south in the 1940s, 1950s, who had the first television, had to use a telephone, who had electricity, blah, 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 all these stories, and they were right there. Well, I, I lost my parents a few years ago, and so I didn't have that resource. Uh, so I, I caught myself reading a lot of um, fiction, <laughs> Faulkner, uh, not a lot of Faulkner, not, not, I can't take much of Faulkner, but just a little bit. Um, <laughs> I grew up with Faulkner. When you grow up in Mississippi, there's a state law that says everybody, every high school senior <laughs> has to read uh, Faulkner. And every high school English teacher in Mississippi thinks that she can teach The Sound and the Fury. And nobody can teach The Sound and the Fury. <laughs> nobody can read it. Uh, but uh, but you know, Eudora Welty, Flannery O'Connor, some of the great Southern writers, a little bit of, you know, to get the flavor. Some research into uh, you know, other books, other novels set in the South. And it's pretty easy. I mean, I remember some of Jim Crow. Because uh, again, I was born in the, in the South in 1955 and, and lived through a lot of that. I remember, I remember a lot of it. So it, and I have you know black friends who uh, have told stories about what it was like living through that era. So it kind of all came together. Yeah. So the the place though where you go even farther afield is that because this is a mystery of motive. Um, you do this wonderful thing, which is you sort of have a, the first third of the book where the events occur that, uh, with, with Pete, the principal character, and then it goes back. Uh, and, and what we do is we go back into Pete's past, and particularly his experience as a soldier in the Second World War. And we get sort of closer to this person who's done this horrible thing. And it, it, plays a very, it has a very interesting impact for the reader because your sense of should you support this guy or not starts to shift as your feelings about what he's been through start to change and evolve. Um, but that middle third where you really are describing the war in the Philippines is, is even farther afield, let's say, right? So how did, you, how did you prepare yourself to write that very compelling sequence? Well, having, having uh, said that I outline everything, uh, Obviously, that's not true, because uh, 
I didn't outline that. I did not see that coming. And that's the great thing about writing a novel. You, you can't plan every, You can't predict everything. You, you can't predict every character you're going to meet or every, every subplot you're going to run into. But I, I knew Pete was going to go off to war. I, I was always always been fascinated with uh, World War II and the, uh, the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. And I, I sort of started re researching that, and I found a book written by a survivor. And they're probably, I've probably read 15 books written by the survivors of the Bataan Death March. And they're all the same, and they're all different, and they're all fascinating, and they're, they're all compelling. And these were just ordinary 19-year-old American kids who, you know, were captured and brutalized by the Japanese. And so every, it got deeper and deeper and deeper into the, the story. And the more I read, the, the more I wanted to write. And I really had to cut back on the, um, the horrible conditions that... The soldiers, our soldiers, went through, and and uh, because I couldn't believe it, I, I couldn't believe the uh, savagery and, and how anybody survived that. When I wrote the first draft, um, Renee, my wife, read the first draft of, of that section, and she said, "You can't, you got to tone this down. This is way, this is too barbaric." And I thought I'd, I thought I'd toned it down, and uh, she said, "You can't. This is just too graphic." And so I went back through it again and again and again, trying to uh, take some of the uh, brutality out of it, but but you but it's th still there. And then, and of course, the reason is you, you once you realize when, he, when our hero survives and comes back home and realizes uh, how he has been betrayed, he cannot accept the fact that it happened while he was suffering. So yeah, and so it, it, that compels him to to do what he does on page one. Does it? Did that change? As you say, you weren't planning for that segment. But yet it surfaces, and then yeah. you're investigating this experience that he's been through. So did your feelings towards your protagonist change as that was being written, in essence? You know, where, he, where suddenly you know him better and what he's been through? Were you, did you find your sympathies changing and mounting as that was written? Well, you certainly, you certainly get to know your protagonist better as you write, as you, as you create more and more conflict uh, for him, and, and you get to know him better. I, I knew what was going to happen. I wasn't certain how the war, the POW stuff would play. I knew it would be brutal uh, for obvious reasons, but I wasn't really sure where that was going. I knew he would come back. I knew uh, from that point what was going to happen to all of them. Uh, but again, that goes back to the careful planning of the novel. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, right now Faulkner, uh, second of Welty, uh, O'Connor, and they get referenced in the book as well. And, and very, you know, diff different people are reading them uh, 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 and the part of the context. Could you talk about what you think a Southern novel is? I mean, because to some degree, I feel like this is very much in the tradition of, of a Southern novel, looking at the South and what the South means and what, what, it, uh, what constitutes the Southern experience. Well, it's Southern Gothic. I love Southern Gothic, these, these tales of uh, these declining. And then Faulkner, you know, Faulkner wrote about this for 40 years. And Eudora Welty, um, the declining Southern family, the... The eccentric characters, the loss of a way of life, the the racial tension, the the attachment to the land, or in losing that land, and and the <laughs> the, the bad stuff, the insanity, the murder, the you know rape and incest, and all all this stuff goes into a a, a good a Southern Gothic book. Um, I don't read. I mean, I grew up reading them. I don't read them much anymore. Uh, but that's, and again, I, I want to try it one time. I want to try a Southern Gothic novel. This is it. Yeah. It's out of my system. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, I've just finished the next book. Uh, it'll come out in October, and it has nothing to do with uh, uh, Southern Gothic. Did you enjoy it, though, going and exploring the South in that fashion? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what you, it's, it's the DNA. It's what I know. I mean, it's, it's what my ancestors knew, my family knew, my First seven years of my life, I was we did, we had no money or land, but but I was I lived on a cotton farm in rural Arkansas, and my father was a sharecropper, and life was tough, and life was very. My grandparents had done the same thing, and life was tough for them. And uh, the, the 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 greatest decision my parents ever made when I was seven years old was to get off the damn farm, just leave and go out and join the rest of the world and get a real job and. Before long, we were living in the suburbs, and life was a whole lot better. My cousins stayed on the farm, and it's not, you know, it was not a good choice. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it to a point. Um, but again, I'm, again, I'm, I think I'm kind of done with that. Okay. <laughs> another, another sort of arena that you explore here. Um, I don't know if it's the first time, but but it's 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 certainly explored very closely, which is is small town life. 
because, and you do it in this terrific way, which is as these events unfold, you take a murder in a small town on page one, and you investigate the, how the various uh, you know, congregations respond, you know, because everybody in town belongs to some congregation. You look at how the different classes respond, how the different races respond. And there's this great sort of investigation of these bit characters who have different jobs on the periphery of the events. You know, the, the, the African American who cleans the courthouse and so has visibility on events kind of that, that the rest of the citizens in town don't see as, as well. And, um, and so I, I thought that was a, a lovely sort of depiction of events in small town America and, and, and how they, 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 they play out. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the, that's how I started with A Time to Kill. A Time to Kill is, it starts with a horrific crime in, in, in the same, same town. Uh, 30 years later, and... Um, oh, is that right? I missed that. So this is the same town as in same Time to Kill? Time to Kill was, uh, it happened around 1985, fictionally. Uh, it was based on a true story. This was 40 years earlier, uh, and so it's the same place, same, some of the same names, uh, not the same characters. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's, what, it's, it's what I know. When I wrote A Time to Kill, I started writing that book in 1985, and it took three years to write it. And I was, I had this... Um, I was a small town lawyer in, a t in Mississippi, and I was struggling, and I was dreaming of the big case, the big, I wanted to be in a courtroom, I wanted to be a big time trial lawyer, I wanted to, you know, I wanted that kind of work, but I wanted a big, the big case where everybody comes to watch the trial, and, you know, the guilt or innocence is not going to be decided ahead of time, and no, who knows what the jury's going to do, and, and I, I was trying a lot of cases, I tried murder cases fresh out of law school, but I, I, I was also about to starve to death. Um, and in the, in the small town. So anyway, I, I told The Time to Kill, it played out through the eyes of Jake, my alter ego, and, and that was basically me in, in that small town, and again, trying to survive, dealing with, uh, with um, unpleasant people who didn't like what I was doing. That, that is, since I lived that, it, 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 it's, that comes natural. The small town life in Mississippi, um, just is, that's the way I grew up. You know, I know the people, the characters from both sides of the tracks. I know the issues, the, the class structures, the, the food, the, the drinking, the, the fooling around, the churches, the religion, the, all, you know, that's just, that's in the, in the DNA. Could you, um, could you talk a little bit about, we've talked about, about outline a bit, can you talk more generally about your process of, of particularly, you have this, this incredible output. Right, you're you know you're writing a book at least once a year. I mean, if you look back over time, something like that. Um, w w you must be very disciplined in the way that you're setting that up. When do you tend to get an I your idea? When do you commit to it? How do you lay it out? How do you see it through to the end? As, as far as the ideas go, uh, I, I keep a list of things I would like to do, to explore. Uh, the book I just finished is called The Guardians. Uh, it's out October 15. Soon to be in fine bookstores everywhere, so uh, <laughs> it's a great read. Um, it's all about wrongful convictions, and um, I'm on the board of the Innocence Project in New York, and that's I spend a lot of time with. Uh, thank you. That has consumed a lot of my life since I published The Innocent Man in, in 2006. Uh, once you once you realize that there are thousands of innocent people in prison um, who shouldn't be there, you know, because they're innocent and how difficult it is to get them out, uh, that has been uh, very much a part of my life since then. And so The Guardians is all about uh, wrongful convictions and how they happen and, and how difficult it is to get somebody out even after you can prove that they're innocent. So, and it's got a good suspense, you know, it's a Grisham novel. You've got dead bodies and sex and all kinds of... Uh, so anyway, but yeah, okay, take, take, the, take the headlines. You've got, uh, you know, two more mass shootings yesterday. So you have the issue of gun control. I'm probably not going to get near that anytime soon. Uh, the opioid crisis is, is something I, I, I watch. Um, I don't have the story. It's so big. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's so many different la layers between big pharma, doctors, hospitals, the government, the victims. You know, I, I don't have that book yet. It, I may have it tomorrow. I don't have that story yet. Uh, but I'm always thinking about you know, what would be a, a great story dealing with an issue uh, that I can weave a legal thriller through, and maybe I get to explore that issue. Uh, the readers get to explore that issue. Um, and so that, that's what I enjoy doing. Um, there are times, though, when uh, Renee says, just stop preaching and write a good old thriller, okay? Get off your soapbox, okay, and go write a book. Uh, so we have those conversations. But I'm always looking for the next idea. And then uh, every year on January the 1st, I start writing. I've got the outline done. 
Um, I know the beginning, the middle, the end. I know the last scene. Um, or, or not almost exactly, but I could have a good idea. And, uh, I, and I write uh, almost every day that I'm home, uh, through January through my goal, July the 1st, six months. And, um, and I, I'm al almost always real close to being on time. Is that first draft? That's the first, or is that the, the revised draft by July 1st? Well, the first draft, uh, the first draft nobody sees. Okay. Um, when I start writing every morning at about 7.30, I go back and, and read what I wrote the day before to clean that up, to make a lot of changes, and to get back in the flow of the story. It's all about rhythm and pacing and how do you keep the reader hooked, you know, and you can't, the, 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 the one criticism I can't stand, either if it's from Renee or from my agent or my editor in New York, is, is when they say, this, this drags, <laughs> this scene, do you need it? Do you need this scene? Do you need this character? This, this, is, this is going nowhere. Well, that, that's a red flag. And I'll go back and I'll rework that. So I'm reworking it the whole time. And then um, after I get about halfway through, the goal is 100,000 words. Um, and when I get about halfway through, then uh, Renee reads the first half, and she loves to mark it up. Uh, she reads with a red pen, and she makes far too many pissy comments in the margins. <laughs> Especially about the female characters. She loves to just really give me a hard time about the female characters. And... Uh, so we go through that process, and then toward the end, it's almost chapter by chapter, back and forth, back and forth, and there's some uh, some pretty good fights, you know. But we we get to the end of it. That's a that's a pretty clean draft once once I'm finished there, and then that goes in um, to my agent, who was my first editor, uh, David Gurnett published. He bought the firm in 1990. He published it in '91. We've been together ever since. And so he's been my agent for the last 25 years. So I'm dealing with, with people I really trust. David does the line edit. That comes back. And then usually around the, for the last week of June or so, I'll turn in. I'll submit the manuscript. And then we'll spend a month uh, copy editing and going through that process, which is painful. Uh, but I mean, once you're done with it, you're done with it. You know? And you, you know, when you write that fast, uh, it's nice to, be, to get rid of the book. Um, you're much slower. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I love taking cheap shots at you guys who don't write very fast. Because because one time I one time I was talking with, with Stephen Stephen King and I were on stage, and at that time he, I'd only written like thirty books and he'd written forty five, and uh, he was giving me a hard time. Okay, so. Uh, so, June July. Well, what happens in the second half of the year? Is that, are you, are you, we're, July for, you're, we're, we're, we're here? You, uh, you get to relax. Yeah, well, yeah. Are you we, gearing up? No, we relax. Okay. We, we, we go to the beach with the kids. Yeah. We travel around. We uh, do stuff like this. We've never been here before. I always wanted to come. We have a bucket list of places we want to see. We try to travel. Uh, we have two, we have two new little grandkids. That takes a lot of time. Uh, so uh, we goof off um, pretty much July and August. And then invariably by Labor Day, um, I'm bored, and so I started the kids series. R okay, so that's a, that's a fall event. Yeah, kids that's fall. Series. Well, the the small big books and small books. Right. The small books are um, books like Bleachers. Uh, I've written two football books, Playing for Pizza and Bleachers, uh, a baseball novel, uh, Calico Joe, a comic novel, uh, Skipping Christmas, and then um, the now seven kids books. So, I, so I, yeah, I'll do something in the fall. Uh, two years ago, I wrote a book called Camino Island, yep. which is um, which came out yeah just two years ago, and I toured quite a bit with that and had a lot of fun. And uh, when the firm came out thirty years ago, ninety one, one of the first reviews said called it, uh, called it a beach book, <laughs> which didn't really tick me off because I love beach books. Okay, <laughs> you know they they sell real well, and so. Um, so w with Camino Island, I said, okay, I'm going to write a mystery with no lawyers, uh, no legal issues, but a, a good old-fashioned mystery. I'm going to publish it in late May as the ultimate beach book. And that's what we did. We, 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 we uh, embraced the term beach book, and so it did real well. And so now I'm writing um, uh, a kind of a sequel to Camino Island that I'll write this fall, and it'll come out 
probably next summer as another beach book. Oh, a sequel to Camino Island. Really? Yeah, well, it's, it's the same characters, same characters, yeah. same setting, same, uh, same, yeah, so sort of a sequel. Yeah. Terrific. Okay, uh, can you talk a little about what you read and what you like to read? What has influenced you? Sure, 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 sure. Um, there are, um, you know, a handful of writers that when they publish, I'm going to buy the book. Yeah, I'm going to buy the book, and write the end and read it. And you're on that list if you would ever get finished with the next book, okay? Right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's in it. Speaking of which, when's the next book? Yeah, uh, exactly. Soon. So. <laughs> Don't you have a two-book deal with... Uh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I, I'm, but I'm no deadlines. I'm working on I'm working on the first draft. I will, I, but I don't tend to share my first draft. So that's a, you know I, I do I do that. I don't share with anybody, including my wife, until I'm done. And, and I hope to finish that first draft at the end of this year. But then I will probably sit with it for six months to you know nine what, months. What does that mean? What, what I mean <laughs> you sit with a manuscript. Yeah, yeah it keeps me company. <laughs> Oh, you know, I like to, I like to, I like to rethink it and, and revise it. So yeah, I revise it from beginning to end twice, and that takes I don't know, you know, I can take a, a series okay. of months, because okay. then that's when I get I get my feedback after the first draft, and then so who, so who reads it first? Well, when the first draft is done, my wife reads it, but then I, you know, sort of like you, my agent, my editor, uh, and three friends, and then I kind of get them all to read it at the same time. And I have lunch with each of them over the course of no wonder it takes so long. Yeah. <laughs> You're lunching and you're sitting with yeah, your manuscript. Exactly. <laughs> come on, Amor. Let's go. Come on, get off. Get off. Get off. That's right. Yes, this is my process. <laughs> Can I do lunch with you? In yeah, okay, that's we'll right. Yeah, I'll put you on the list. We'll sit down and have a two-hour lunch. It's going to slow me down, though. <laughs> I have it can't to add a week. It I can't slow add. you much more. Yeah, okay. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Who are the three friends? I'm not being nosy. Just bu oh, buddies. Uh, <laughs> oh, pal. Is this your book club? Well, two, uh, two, uh, two of them are no, in he, there. He's got the neatest book club. Yeah. Just, just talk about that. <laughs> Which I, I don't have a book club. Yeah, I have no, no you, book don't, club. you don't have a book club. I know. No. Yeah. My so, wife does, yes. but I'm, I'm not in a book club. So uh, what John's talking about is, is uh, I read with three friends, uh, uh, two women and a man. So it's you know two two men and two women in, the, in total, including me. We're all married, but we're not. None of our spouses are involved. And, but uh, we've been reading together for 16 years, and we meet on a monthly basis to discuss a novel over a long dinner. And we work in uh, projects. So, like, we'll read... Uh, actually, this year we're doing uh, uh, American female writers of the 20th century, but particularly the first half of the 20th century. So we begin with Edith Wharton, and we'll read four of her books, and then we'll do Don Powell. We're doing Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor, and... Um, and, and so that will, it'll be it take us a year to kind of work through that that project, um, and it's great fun, you know, because we will go into a restaurant at seven and we will close the place, you know, at twelve thirty. You know, we're the last people there. Could I come and sit through it? Yeah, well, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe without reading the book. It's very exclusive. <laughs> it's very exclusive. But you put you push each other to read the good stuff, right? Yeah, we we push it, and, and the, the great thing is, well, I'll, I'll tell you this little story, because it's true. So we, we, we did the Russians, and which are great. You know, we revisited the Russians a number of years ago, and we get to, to Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky's great book. And we'd all read it at the age of 18 or 19. And we all remembered it as this kind of, well, pretty philosophically heavy and, you know, ponderous, and, you know, it went very deep and dark and went on and on, whatever, you know, et cetera. We read it, and we all came to dinner very excited. Because we're all like, you know, this book is so much better than we remembered. I mean, it was so much fun. It's exciting. It's a crime. It's a procedural. You know, the detective in it famously is what Peter Falk based Columbo on. Like, no joke. And he, you can see it. The, the, the detective will leave Russ Kalnikov's room, and then he'll come back and say, oh, one more thing, you know, with that whole thing. You go, oh, my God, that's where Falk got that. So, so, but, so, and, and there's this terrible villain in the final quarter of the book who's shocking. You can't believe how awful this amoral figure is. And not one of us remembered this character. And we kept discussing it, and finally we realized the reason none of us had remembered it is because at the age of 18, none of us had finished the book. <laughs> you know? That's what happens, right? So at any rate, neither so, did I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you're still you still haven't finished it. So but anyway, so that's that's the pleasure of going back to some of these books that you know that we were told about with admiration in our youth. We understand them better now as adults, but in addition, we finish them.
the, the first time we discussed this in Brooklyn, uh, you were you guys were going through the you read, you read seven novels of Toni Morrison. That's right. Seven that's right. that year. That's right. That's, that's a pretty good way to, to push yourself. Well, you know, to move chronologically yeah. through an author, you really get to see how they develop and how they find new themes and and what they're, you know, b how they're building their mastery of craft. Yeah. You know, so it's fun. So I have to find three friends who, can, who read a lot. Huh? Yeah, that's what you need. You need three okay. friends. Right, we'll let you come. Well, who read? I'll, I'll, I'll ask the group. We'll see if we can get you get you to come. <laughs> so back to my question: Are these the three guys who read your manuscript? Yes. So well, uh, t uh, two of them are are are, are read the, the the you know one the. This is terrible. I've never missed. The fourth one didn't like my first book, mm. <laughs> so I didn't give her the second. You know, it's terrible. That's a terrible instinct. We right? have such thin skin, though. I know, right? <laughs> like, no, never. But yeah, so so they're in the little group, and as I say, then I have these lunches which take all this time, and then once I've had the lunches, I kind of heard the feedback. Are they? Are they? I mean, can they say anything? Are they tough on you? Yes, and yeah, they are all serious. They're all willing to give serious criticism. And, and it's like you. They, you know, I'm interested in what's dragging for them, yeah. what's not convincing, what's boring, what's confusing. And then I retreat with that and sit on my manuscript <laughs> <laughs> and then revise. Sit, sit with the manuscript. Sit with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the process. Yeah. All right, so back, back to what I'm reading. Yeah. Is that the question? Yes. I forget these questions. Yes. Um, I love John Le Carre. Uh, I, I, I've read most of his books. Uh, he, in 1980, he published a book called Little Drummer Girl which is just one of my favorites. Uh, I read it then. I wasn't thinking about writing back then. But once I started writing, I, I reread Little Drummer Girl, and I, I read it now probably every five or six years. And you, I, can, you, I that, you say it. you learned a lot from that, too. Well, right? I just learned. I, I was inspired to write uh, smart suspense, really smart suspense, uh, with uh, clues dangling, you know, just all kinds of issues, uh, you know, all, all the violence. It's, it's a great setting. It's almost it's a true story. Uh, very clever. I just love that book. Um, I read. I enjoy uh, when Scott Turow publishes. Scott's a buddy. Um, in 1987, when Scott published uh, Presum *Presumed Innocent*, just sort of electrified the genre of the legal thriller. It was. I don't remember that genre before before *Presumed Innocent*. And um, I read that book uh, that summer of '87, the same summer of *Bonfire of the Vanities*. It was a good summer, big big book. And so uh, I, th I was so envious. I was trying to finish *The Time to Kill*. And here was Scott, you know, you know, getting all the headlines and, and, and selling books and making money. I'm thinking, that I, I'm really envious in a good way. I, that, I, that's what I want to do. And, and I've told, we've, we've talked about this, Scott and I have. It was very inspirational for me at that moment to have him come along with that book because it really fired me up. And I got finished with um, A Time to Kill. Uh, so I read Scott's books. Um, I, I like, uh, you know, other suspense writers, Michael Connolly, uh, James Lee Burke is a favorite. Um, uh, Don Winslow, the the the, the Border Series Cartel, those books I, I, I'm working through those. So yeah, I'm all over the place. I also I also have to read. I don't have to, but I enjoy reading a lot of um, serious nonfiction that deals with things I write about. Uh, like I'm reading a book now about for-profit prisons and how god awful they are. They're worse than regular prisons, and every state's using them. And the inmates suffer because somebody's trying to make a buck off their incarceration. I've written about for-profit law schools with Rooster Bar. Um, so I, but I, but I read several books about the for-profit for education, for-profit. Uh, there are tons of books about wrongful convictions, um, mass incarceration, you know, stuff that I, so I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, well, we're going we're gonna to shift to q and I did want one, one quick thing before that. It, it occurred to me, I think that, you have been, you are considering going on a tour of a scotch tasting, uh, you and your wife. If 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 I can come on the scotch tasting tour, you can come to the book club. <laughs> that was my that's my uh, well you know no okay. don't don't reply deal done yeah just think yeah, about deal. it. Yeah. All right, but now we'd like to open it up to, to questions to the audience, please. Um, oh, here we are. Look at that. This is a technical question, um, and it's kind of from a personal point of view. I found that a number of really good books recently or novels have been in desperate need of editing and I wondered if that's peculiar to the author or have there been less editing done in the last 10 15 years than used to happen well I, I, I can't answer that as far as I'm concerned I, 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 I took the position years ago that um, I want to be edited by the same people. I, I'm lucky. I have my agent who was my first editor. 
and he is not going to spare anything. So I, I get a, I get worked over pretty, pretty tough in in the, in the process. I, I I have heard anecdotally that some writers get so big they they turn the book in and say don't touch it, and that ha you can tell it, and that happens with some people I read, some people I know, uh, because the editing is. Um, is not any fun. I told my kids when they were growing up, there are two things about writing, two important aspects of writing, two of the most important, are two of the most unpleasant. Planning ahead of time, nobody wants to do that because you want to start writing, and then when it's all over, doing the revisions. And don't ever turn in a first draft or a second draft. Don't, I, I told my kids that. They never listened, but, uh, but they, they don't listen to me about writing. They never have. Uh, but I don't know overall. Do you have a sense of? I mean, I think you're right, and, and it's different for editing in terms of theme and pace and editing, copy editing, because those are, in a way, two different jobs. But, but I think there's no question about it. If you look at the number of books a contemporary editor is expected to oversee in a given year, it has increased significantly in the last 100 years. So the era of Maxwell Perkins writing letters back and forth to F. Scott Fitzgerald as they debate the content of a chapter, that's long gone. Because the, the editor is required to publish so many books in the corporation. And so yes, you do get a faster pace and sort of a little bit, uh, it, it opens the door for, for errors, for sloppiness, for all kinds of, of problems. And so it does mean that the author has to be a, even more vigilant on their own to try to keep that as, as clean and tight as possible um, because there's just not as much time for, for the editing organization to, to solve that for you. Greetings from Blaville, Arkansas, where you remain a uh, home county favorite. Hello. How you doing? Uh, with all of your work in the southern genre, do you see anything today changing the socioeconomic balance? Uh, we certainly don't want to lose the eccentricity but are you seeing any hope for change there? Not much. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, a lot has changed in the last 50 years. Um, you know, a lot of laws have gone on the books to protect a lot of people. Uh, but the uh, rates of poverty in the Deep South are still staggering. The, uh, the number of... Um, Kids who go to bed hungry at night uh, across the country is unforgivable, but especially down south. Um, the dropout rate, the incarceration rate, um, uh, yeah, it's it's troubling. The, the people are not people are living shorter lives. The lifespan is going down because they're so unhealthy. Uh, so there's a little bit of hope, but it's there's some huge problems down there. It's, the Bible's in the middle of it. You, you know. We're talking, it's, it's, it's a cotton town in northeast Arkansas, very close to where I was born. Hi. Um, do you have a favorite book that you've written and why? A favorite book that I've written? Yes. And why? Um, well, you have to love all of them <laughs> to, to get finished. I mean, you've got, you got to be in love with the book to finish it. Um, with the benefit of time, I can look back and, you know, look at the books on the shelves and say, you know, that was – that was a better one. That one I wish I could do over. <laughs> you know, I wish I, I wish I had, had changed the, this or that. So I, yeah, but I'm not. I don't spend a lot of time criticizing. I'm too busy m thinking about the next book. Um, a Time to Kill will always have a special place simply because it was the first. It was autobiographical. It was turned down by everybody. Uh, it was rejected, and I finally got a lucky break and got it published. And and now it's it's sold more than all of them. Uh, I'm very fond of a painted house, which is also a, a memoir. The fictionalized memoir because there, there are no lawyers in it, and it's it was a lot about my family in Arkansas. Uh, so yes, you know some I like better than the others. Good question. Yes, sir. subject of, and there were an enormous number of soldiers uh, at Seasport and all through that area. I think the subject of the interaction of, and it was mostly Northerners who were there, uh, you might take a crack at the subject of the interaction of those people uh, with the local community. The gentleman was in the Navy uh, in Biloxi uh, a long time ago, and 
the, the, the suggestion is that it would be a, a fascinating topic to, to, dis, to explore the interaction of mainly northern soldiers in the deep south uh, in the service. Soldiers, sailors, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've heard those stories. There were German POW camps, and my parents knew one in Arkansas. There was one down the road from us in Mississippi, uh, abandoned. But the, uh, but the locals there treated the German POWs better than the Yankee soldiers who'd come down. We're still fighting the Civil War, okay? So we're still, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I wondered how long it's been since you tried a case or whether you miss it. I don't miss it. Uh, <laughs> my last jury trial was in uh, January of 1996 in a small town in Mississippi. I'd already had, the books were out. Uh, right before the firm came out, uh, I was, I'd spent all my money, I was broke again. And I took a, a case involving a guy who got killed on the railroad. And uh, then the firm came out and everything changed. And I wish I hadn't taken the case. And after about five years, the judge said, okay, we're, it's time for a trial. And I had to go back to the courtroom uh, after leaving it for seven years. Trial work is very stressful when you do it every day. Uh, and to go back after a seven year hiatus was, uh, was terrifying. And I said, I, while we were successful. I walked out and I said, if I ever get out of this courtroom, I will never ever voluntarily enter another courtroom. So I'm not, I'm not going back. <laughs> I have a question. Did your growing up with storytelling lead you to the law? And how did your training as a lawyer inform your storytelling as a writer? Uh, I, I don't think I would have ever, ever written a book if I had not been a lawyer. Because I, I did not, it was not a childhood dream. I didn't study creative writing in college. I always read a lot because my mother really wanted us to read. Um, my mother wasn't crazy about television. So we didn't watch much TV, we read books. Uh, but again, I didn't think about writing a book until I was 30 years old. And I, because I was a lawyer, <clears throat> I was in a courtroom one day watching a trial, as I always did if the good lawyers were in town trying cases, I was going to be in the courtroom watching them, and I saw something that inspired me to create this courtroom drama, and as seen through the eyes of a small southern lawyer like myself, and th this, I became obsessed with this, this, this drama, this scene, this, this story, and after, uh, you know, a few months of that, I, I was driving down the road one day, driving back to the state capitol, and I said, I'm going to try to write this, and I was 30 years old, and that was that was the time to kill. So I don't think I would have been motivated to write had I not been a lawyer. As far as the family storytelling, uh, you know, there was a great tradition of storytelling, uh, huge tales. I captured most of them in a painted house, most of the old family stories, probably all fiction, but you know, it was told as fact. Uh, but that had nothing to do with me going to law school. Uh, I, I went to law school because I thought it was a good way to, you know, maybe have a better life, make some more money or whatever. And that was, it was all pure greed. <laughs> John, we have time for one more question. So Great. Uh, Amor, thank you for bringing civility to the <laughs> forefront oh, yeah, well, in your wonderful you. book. George Washington, here, here. Uh, and Mr. Grisham, a big fan. Uh, just talk a little bit, if you will, about the adaptation of your books in, on film and whatever television treatments, because I know a lot of authors, uh, unfortunately, don't have the kind of control that others. So would you comment on that? Sure. First of all, I've been very lucky with Hollywood. I've had nine books adapted to film. Ten Count the Innocent Man, which was a Netflix uh, series last fall. Uh, nine, you know, big movies. And um, eight were fun to watch. <laughs> I enjoyed <laughs> The Chamber was no fun to watch because it was a bad movie. Uh, years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to meet Stephen King early in my career. He reached out. We got together and we spent some time together riding around in Mississippi. He stayed with us and we had a ball. And we talked about movies. And he's had every experience in the world from Kathy Bates winning the Oscar in Misery to having to sue a company to stop production. He's been through everything, and he loves it. He's, he's, still up, he's up to his eyeballs right now in TV series. He just loves that world, and I don't. But Steve, Steve said, look, here's the deal. When it comes to Hollywood, there are two groups of writers. The first group consists of those who do not deal with Hollywood. Their stuff's not for sale, okay? He said, that's a very small group. Uh, <clears throat> the second group consists of those of us who do. If you're going to deal with Hollywood, there are a couple, three rules that you need to live by. 
Number one, get all your money up front. <laughs> number two, kiss it goodbye. And number three, expect it to be something different. If you don't like that, go join the first group. <laughs> and that's been my attitude ever since. I don't get involved. Uh, we, try to, we try to deal with good people we dealt with before. I haven't had a movie made in 15 years uh, because the whole business changed. But uh, I've, I've been lucky with Hollywood. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, John Grisham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.